Recently here in the Sudbury area, a bear hunting couple was charged $7,500 for wildlife infractions and had their hunting licenses suspended. The more interesting part of the story though is that a search of the couple's residence turned up five black bear gallbladders. In Ontario, the possession and sale of black bear gallbladders has been illegal since 1996, but this has not stopped hunters from harvesting their organs. Currently, a dried black bear gallbladder from an average size animal can yield up to $600 or more. For the most part, the gallbladder is coveted for its medicinal qualities, particularly in Asian cultures, but also in Western medicine, as it is believed to be beneficial in treating liver problems, rheumatism, and even cholesterol reduction. This recent episode made me think about the idea of translocation in my own research. Wildlife translocation generally refers to moving or transplanting animals from one area to another, and is often utilized in mitigating nuisance behavior. However, in this particular context, I am referring to when big game animals, like bears, are hunted and harvested, but moved or shipped elsewhere before or after processing. In my own research on bear management in Ontario and New York State, I endeavor to piece together the whole story. What happens after a bear has been killed? How can we track the broader international connections? Clearly, the recent gallbladder incident and others like it reveal that bears may be killed in areas like northern Ontario, but their parts are destined for more metropolitan locations in Canada or even further away in Asian countries. After a bear is killed, it or its parts become part of an, an illegal transnational commodity exchange where the animal is reduced to a medical product. Of course, this black market industry is difficult to trace except through documented cases, but there have been other stories of international black bear translocation in Ontario that have been legal, but have largely gone unnoticed. In the early 20th century, Ontario had very few laws and strategies in place to manage its considerable black bear population. The first spring hunt was brought in in 1937 after rising complaints throughout the 1930s that bears were threatening crops and property. The hunt did not generate much fanfare amongst Ontario's residents, and this legislation was eclipsed five years later when the province introduced a bounty on bears in agricultural and semi-agricultural areas. Under the order in council, $10 was to be paid for adult bears and $5 for cubs. During the bounty years, which lasted until 1961, the province paid bounties on approximately 14,000 adult bears and 1,400 cubs, roughly $150,000. While Ontario's trappers and farmers were happy to shoot any marauding bears simply for their trespasses, across the Atlantic Ocean, bears were coveted for other reasons. After the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, the British Grenadier Guards incorporated bear skin headpieces into their uniforms. In 1831, this was extended to two other regiments of foot guards then in existence. Today, the caps are most commonly associated with the Queen's Guards at Buckingham Palace. During the mid-1950s, the British War Office experienced a shortage in bearskins, Blaming it on the assumption that bears were so well protected in Canada as a whole that there was no chance of obtaining Canadian bearskins. However, this was incorrect because, as noted before, bears in Ontario had virtually no protection at this time. In 1959, the War Office and the Ministry of Supply met to discuss the urgent need for new headpieces, citing the apparent Canadian shortage, limited furs from Russia, and an inability to produce nylon caps, they tried to iron out how they would solve the problem. At this time, regiments in Canada also used bearskins in their dress uniforms, so the idea was thrown about that perhaps some of these caps could be borrowed. However, with no immediate solution found at the meeting, it appeared as though the British Army would march into the 1960s with ragged bearskins. Yet, an innocuous letter to the editor in the Times London in March 1959 brought about a new development in the shortage crisis. Peter Page wrote the newspaper and explained that he was embarrassed by the Brigade of Guards at Buckingham Palace who were sporting bedraggled bearskins. He proclaimed that something needed to be done to fix or replace their comic, moth-ridden appearance. The complaint generated a modest conversation amongst Londoners in the newspaper that it was reprinted in other newspapers around the world. The story managed to reach Timmins, Ontario, a gold mining town just over 700 kilometers north of Toronto. Timmins would eventually make headlines in the 1960s after deposits of silver and base metals such as zinc, copper, and nickel were discovered which led to the establishment of the Kid Creek Mine, breathing new life into the economy. Of course, Timmins is also well known for being the hometown of country music sensation Shania Twain. However, in 1959, Timmins had a very small population and was not yet on the map. Sensing an opportunity to bring some attention to his town, Timmins Mayor Leo Del Villano cabled the British War Office and offered to help alleviate the bearskin shortage. He reported that he would no, have no difficulty in providing skins to supply the whole brigade by hunts organized by himself. 
The War Office graciously accepted his personal offer, and so the Great Timmins Bear Hunt of 1959 began. At this time, spring bear hunting had not yet attracted much attention from resident hunters, or even American hunters that it would later be synonymous with. Never before or after would such a massive systematic spring bear hunt be organized in Ontario. The story was quickly picked up by newspapers throughout the world, and the town of Timmins wholeheartedly joined in the enthusiasm. Mike's Supermarket on 3rd Avenue even ran a promotion during the hunt, which offered cash prizes to residents that killed the most bears. Throughout the hunt, the Daily Press, Timmins' local newspaper, reported that correspondents from Time and Life magazine, the BBC, and the London Illustrated News visited the quaint town to cover the story. Leo soon appeared on CBC's television's front page challenge as a mystery guest and also appeared on TV with Hollywood actor Eddie Bracken. Yet not everyone was thrilled with Mayor Del Volano's idea to replenish the Queen's bearskins. Throughout the course of the hunt, from May until June, the Mayor was inundated with letters of criticism from animal rights groups in Canada and other people that were opposed to what they perceived as organized mass slaughtering. The Toronto newspaper, The Globe and Mail, also received a flood of letters from people that questioned the humaneness of the hunt, particularly the fate of young cubs in the spring that might be orphaned. However, the Ontario Department of Lands and Forests Minister, Joseph Spooner, a former mayor of Timmins himself, told Del Volano that as long as the hunt was carried out in an orderly and efficient manner, it was recognized as being in the same category as general hunting. So with the government's blessing, the hunt lasted from mid-May until June, with 62 bears being killed, enough to make around 100 bearskin caps. So in the spring of 1959, Northern Ontario's black bears were hunted down as part of a campaign of boosterism and patriotism. Del Volano was a shrewd politician and undoubtedly realized the publicity the town would get if the story was picked up. In newspapers throughout the country, the hunt was viewed and as an exercise in patriotism. The bear hunters believed they were dutifully restoring greatness to the British Army by refurbishing their bearskin caps. As unwitting actors in this transnational story of big game hunting, the bears were stalked, shot, and translocated as part of a broader effort at maintaining the empire. At a time before Canada apparently underwent a crisis of Britishness, Ontario's black bears were enthusiastically commoditized as imperial headpieces and were offered up to maintain good relations with Britain, a move that paid off particularly well for Leo and his wife Mildred, who accepted an offer to dine with the Queen during her royal visit to Canada in 1959. And so there you have it, the Great Timmins Bear Hunt of 1959. To me, it is an interesting piece of local history for Timmins, but it's much more than that. It is an important part of Ontario's wildlife management history. Given the considerable criticism it received from residents in the province and abroad, even internationally, it is arguable that the massive wave of publicity triggered by the hunt might have forced the Ontario government to revise its current bear management system. Less than two years afterwards, Ontario repealed the bear bounty and introduced tighter game laws for hunting bears in the province. This included the adoption of a, a bag limit and more stringent closed seasons. In addition, because Mayor Del Volano put the spring bear hunt on center stage, many people in southern Ontario became aware of a type of activity that, up until then, they had probably never heard of or were familiar with. As a result, they became concerned with the idea of cubs being orphaned in the springtime and had qualms about bears being killed immediately after hibernation. For the most part, even after this historic hunt had ended, many of these concerns lingered in southern Ontario for quite some time. Interestingly, 40 years later, the spring bear hunt again made headlines and divided Ontario when animal rights groups campaigned and won the fight to have the spring bear hunt repealed, much to the chagrin of hunters and northern Ontario residents. But that is a story best saved for another day.